Hello and welcome to Curator with a Camera. I'm Anthony Cools, Senior Curator at the National Railway Museum and today we're in New Hall at Locomotion in Shildon to have a look at the Thomas Smith steam crane. Moving heavy things has been a challenge to mankind for centuries, whether it's how did they get the stone to the pyramids or how do you launch an ocean liner. But one thing has always been there, moving big things from one place to another and lifting them off the ground. Now, throughout the Industrial Revolution period, the industrial growth of the 18th and 19th century, when products began to be made and handled within factories, bales of wool, bales of cotton, boxes of finished products, they needed machinery and equipment to help people move stuff. So hand cranes initially were the thing. You could wind a crane with the power of one or two people and lift a ton and a half. But of course that's strenuous and it can lead to injury and backache and all sorts of problems. So if you've got a new piece of technology or something that can do the work for you, then why not embrace it? So this is where Thomas Smith of Rodley in Leeds come in, who made our steam crane. Now, Smiths of Rodley were making hand cranes in the 1840s to fit in with the textile industry of Yorkshire. And they were making hand cranes that would move all sorts of bits and pieces. But of course, as I say, that's backbreaking. It's labor intensive and you want something that is much more straightforward and less risky. So let's embrace the steam power. Let's embrace the steam engine and make cranes, said Smiths. So around 1860, the first Smith of Rodley steam crane comes in. So you find that in industry, they are buying steam cranes to work in yards. Yes, sometimes to move goods from the factory into mainline railway wagons, but quite often on their own. So you find networks of small lines within quarries, within wood yards, where a steam crane is there operating. And the steam cranes the, like these, they are known as locomotive steam cranes. They can move themselves along. You'd never pull a train with it, but they can move themselves around, possibly sometimes pushing a wagon that might have coal for them on it, possibly sometimes moving a bit of stone, but they don't go very fast. They don't go very far. Big civil engineering projects had steam cranes, much as you have high-rise tower cranes now to move materials. And in fact, that's where our steam crane began its life in the 1930s with McAlpine's construction. So it's a very simple machine, but it is railway. It runs on rails, it's powered by steam. And so the steam crane, the five ton yard traveling locomotive steam crane is ubiquitous. They are there from the 1850s, 1860s when Booth start making them, right through to the present day because there are a number of steam cranes that are still in use, not necessarily any longer with steam boilers on them, but with compressed air attached so that they can then do the work. They can still operate without the need for coal and water, but compressed air does the job. So the steam crane has had a long history. This crane was taken out of use in the 1980s, went to the Museum of London, who then transferred it to us about 15 years ago, and our team in the workshops at Locomotion, including some of our apprentices, worked very long and hard to bring it to the state that you see it today. So not only let's have a look at see how it works, but let's also see some of the work that the team did here to enable us to bring it to the state that you see it in today. We've switched sides to have a look in a bit more depth because I can stand back that little bit further from the crane here. And this really is a completely unremarkable piece of equipment. It is a tool to do a job, but quite a rare survivor now. Many of these were preserved in the 1960s and 70s and then when the boilers required repair, they were sent away for scrap. And therefore, 
to have this in the National Collection is very representative of that whole thing of British industry needing to move materials on a railway with or without a locomotive. So we'll see on this end of the crane there are no couplings, no buffers, no nothing because it is a self-propelled machine that will drive itself along to where it needs to do the job. So here it is. This is, this is the powerhouse of the steam crane. A very large vertical boiler, almost as tall as you can get. In fact, probably taller for some of the ones that are in private yards because they don't have to go out on the national network. They don't have to go out on the main line. So then you would have a very a tall, what they call a stovepipe chimney on top of that so it enable you to have the draft for the boiler. Very efficient steam raisers, these vertical boilers. Very effective indeed. But because you don't need to worry about going under bridges or through tunnels, you can make it as big as you want, as tall as you want. So there it is, the vertical boiler. Firebox door there with various what are called manholes and mud holes. In fact, those are called mud holes. These little ones there, because you can get inside it, you can open them up for inspection and also to clean all the gunge out from inside the boiler that operates. And then at the top in the middle there, that's called a manhole because you've, you're thin enough, you can get your head and your shoulders in there and inspect and work on the boiler in a shell itself. Two water gauges, again, a steam engine, so very important to keep an eye on your water level. And then above that, a pressure gauge, redlined at 100. You know, this isn't like uh, Flying Scotsman at 200 plus pounds per square inch. It does a job, it needs to have enough steam, but 100 is plenty. And then mounted next to the pressure gauge, you can see there the safety valves on the side of the boiler. So above in, in the steam space, but the safety valves to allow that any excess steam pressure. So a steam generator to do the job. Where does the coal, where is the coal kept? It's just here in this bunker to the side of the uh, boiler itself on the footplate. No fripperies. Big steam valve, main steam valve comes out the top of the boiler, going along there to the steam regulator. So there's a stop valve on the top. These pipes have been relagged with ceramic fibre. They would originally have been asbestos. Of course, we can't use asbestos now, and therefore all the steam pipes, they've been relagged, but using modern ceramic material. Uh, the pipe work on the other side over there are steam injectors, so that you, still, you can still feed water into the boiler once the, uh, the crane has used some of it already in the steam production. Uh, insofar as anything else, what have we got in terms of controls? This is where it starts to get interesting because this is not a locomotive. There's a driver's seat. Looks a bit like a tractor seat, a farm implement seat. That's pretty much because that's what it is. And the driver has a platform here. So he's sitting to operate the steam crane and everything comes to hand. The steam is all controlled from this regulator handle there which the driver would reach forward to and operate like that. That steam then comes down through the steam pipe, which you can see there, comes down to the back of the steam cylinders and operates the steam engine. And there's a cylinder on either side. And there's the cylinder itself with a crosshead going up to the crank. And the crank, of course, bearing the name of Smith Rodley. So it tells you it's a Smith steam crane and they're from Rodley in Leeds. So what is the engine itself driving? It's driving through various sets of gears, these different rope drums and pulleys. So what's happening with these all? You have direction, forward and reverse, or that could well be up and down, depending on where, with the hand lever here down to the engine that reverses the steam engine itself but that then rotates this crankshaft and there are a number of brake wheels and clutch levers that enable you to engage drive to different drums different rope drums which or other different drives which enable the crane to do what it does i.e lifting so here we have, you can see the rope drums there. 
with new wire cables. As part of the restoration, our team fitted new cables to this. They're wire cables. Um, they are multi-stranded, they're twisted together. If you really want to um, look into it, have a look up a rope walk and see how the cables are made. And so there are two drums there. One raises and lowers this lattice jib using that pulley system there with the cables attached to the outside. And then the actual lift rope drum is that one there with this other cable coming along which then goes up to the end of the jib over the pulleys to the hook. We'll go up that way in a minute but before we leave that that's two of the functions that the steam crane will do. It has two others so it will lift and lower the jib, it can lift and lower the material that you're trying to move but it can rotate, it can slew itself. It's got a thing called a slew ring and there is a gear wheel there and that's where you see that uh, you know, the back end of it, everything of it rotates around. But our other function that we talked about it was that it was a locomotive steam crane, it can move itself. So there is a further drive shaft that goes down into the underframe, the undercarriage here, through that ring in the mechanism underneath it's very difficult to see it but if we go right to the bottom you can then see the drive gears which come down and drive give the machine traction so it all four wheels are driven by that steam engine up there and you can move it along to wherever you want it in your wood yard to either move finished planks or fresh tree trunks that you're ready to cut and process into timber. There, whilst I'm on my knees here, Thomas Smith & Son Rodley Limited, Rodley near Leeds, just in case you needed to make sure you knew where they came from. But also what I was saying earlier about the um, size of this thing, there's a very specific note there, for yard use only, not to be run over service lines, because A, it's too tall with the chimney on the boiler, but also you don't want to have the risk of striking anything with this jib itself because of course the jib is the best part of 30 feet long and when it's raised it makes the crane very very tall indeed. A couple of other details whilst I get my breath back from being on the floor. When the steam has done its work in the engine it then goes out of this pipe across the bottom of the footplate and over into an exhaust box there where there would be a vertical pipe which would then uh, exhaust the steam to atmosphere. But also, you think about what this crane's doing, it's lifting. It's a five ton capacity crane, so it needs to be solid and secure when it's lifting. It, you don't want it to tip over, you want it to be balanced. So there is a box here. I think this actually is our, uh, this is our water tank for the capacity for the engine because it's a steam engine. So the water gives it weight in there but also within, under these covers on the framing is the best part of several tonnes of scrap iron. Interestingly enough, like we were saying, one set of buffers at this end of the actual unit itself and no normal coupling in between, but a shackle so that if it did need to move something or pull something then you could putter around with a trolley or something and uh, whatever was needed and there quite nicely on the uh, on the framing you can see there the name of where, who made the steel uh, not a million miles from here Dorman Long and Company of Middlesbrough always nice to see a rolling mark in uh, in the steel and therefore you definitely know where it's come from the load indicator here, which with safety in mind tells the people operating the crane and the, the gang around it whether the crane is within its safe working load, it's SWL, you'll sometimes see that in abbreviations. Very important because modern day cranes, they have bells and whistles that go off if you overload it. That indicator will tell you everything that you need to know. Now here is our jib, quite lightweight, it's got to be lightweight but strong because you don't want to be spending all your energy lifting the jib up 
and you want it to, and actually if you made this out of plate, it would be so heavy that it would be um, impractical. So here it is, sections of angle bolted together and riveted together. And we come right up to the top end of the jib, which is quite lower for us. And um, there are the two, the cables going down to the pulley on the top, where is, which is how you have that mechanism of raising and lowering the jib. And then this other pulley over the top at the end of the jib itself, coming down to the hook, which of course would then be attached to straps, shackles, ropes, whatever you needed to lift it. Out of deference to the crane, we've got a uh, structure that's been made for us, a trestle that accommodates and takes the weight of that jib in terms of conservation and care and cost for the crane, whilst we have new ropes on it, we've put this trestle in to um, make sure that the crane's strain is taken. So you can't say the crane takes the strain, but the trestle takes the strain. And there it is, the Smith Rodley steam crane, a walk from front to back, something that thousands of people saw every day without even knowing it because they were there in every railway yard, in every works yard, in every factory, moving goods, being the power of the industrial railway that nobody ever saw. Thanks for joining us today for an uplifting curator with a camera. If you've enjoyed what you've seen, why not like and subscribe so you don't miss out on future episodes.